Bent Larsen of Denmark playing against Lothar Schmidt of West Germany. And for both these players tonight, absolutely vital. They've both made really rather an indifferent beginning to the chase after the Master Game prize and the money prize of £2,500. As we can see from the board, so far things not quite going their way. Tony Miles setting the pace in this group with one and a half points already. Uh, Lothar Schmidt, if he wins tonight, could of course be equal, but he is up against a truly formidable opponent, Bent Larsen, who wasn't here last year. With me, as usual, is Bill Hartston to give his views and opinions on the game. Bill, first of all, uh, what chance Lothar Schmidt playing black against Bent Larsen playing white? Well, we all saw last year what a resilient, tenacious, defensive player Schmidt is. Um, of course, he's not the only one who's got to win today. It's even more important for Larsen. He started as one of the favourites of this tournament and lost his first game. Now he really must try and win the last two. And I think that's in Schmidt's favour, because Larsen absolutely has to, to risk everything to win today. Mm. So Larsen's not going to be offering any draws? Oh, no. Right, well, the game has already begun. Uh, before we join the players, bring us up to date with what's happened. Larson's often said that when he doesn't have any particular ideas about what opening to play, he starts with the English opening, c2 to c4, and just waits to see what turns up. Schmidt non-committal start, but soon we reach a really classical Queen's Gambit. This is the classical Queen's Gambit position. And already Larson takes a critical decision, exchanging pawns in the center. And this completely sets the tone for the rest of the game. Black has more pawns on the queen's side, white has more pawns on the king's side, uh, and it's always the pawns that, that determine what's going to happen in the middle game. But first, the players have to get their pieces out. Bishop's coming out first. Pawn stabilizing the center, both sides stabilizing. Another bishop coming out. And this is a move the uh, purist theoreticians don't like. They say the h-pawn may be a weakness later in the game if black castles kingside. Also it gives white the, the chance to develop his bishop on, an, on a different diagonal. It's difficult to believe this can be a bad move, but they say so. All the minor pieces developed by white. Now the start of a, a little knight manoeuvre. The knight's coming to either e6 or g6 to attack this bishop on f4. So white must prepare a retreat square for it. He wants to preserve this bishop, doesn't want it exchanged. h3, so the bishop can come back to h2. Is that theoretically as bad a move as uh, black's h6? White still has the option of castling either kingside or queenside. Perhaps already he's thinking about castling on the long side. Now the bishop's being exchanged. Another exchange of minor pieces, and this is leading to doubling of the black g-pawns. And now we must just wait to see where white's going to put his king. This is absolutely critical. Uh, white can either castle on the king's side and try to advance these queenside pawns. That's called a minority attack. You attack with a minority of pawns to try to create some weaknesses up here. Or he castles queenside and advances the king's side pawns for a direct attack on the black king, which we expect will end up on the king's side. And he has already apparently created a, a weakness on Schmidt's king side. It's Larsen white to play. Let's join the players. I want to play knight e5. I could also play queen b3 so that his bishop has to stay at home for a moment. But knight e5 is nice because it, it forces him to play g5. He cannot play bishop f5 because of g4. And I don't think he has any reasonable knight move. No. Knight e5 looks natural. I hate making natural moves. Queen b3, no. Knight e5. Yes, now, of course, he is attacking my pawn, and I have to push bishop f5 would be a mistake because of g4. That's the only move, g5, but I think it is sufficient. I could still castle kingside. It's not so bad. Castles, and later, maybe f4. I have the square e5, he gets the square e4. But it doesn't... No, I think I have to... I have to castle queenside. The queen can go to 
c2 or d3 that stops his bishop from going to f5 if i go to c2 then afterwards my rook on d1 is directly uh, threatening well indirectly threatening his queen also i like it because he gets the f file he gets the f file i like to protect f2 queen c2 he now threatens to mate me or to win the queen by queen check on g6 of course of i have to castle the only move but a good move i think i can play g4 first maybe h4 but no g4 he makes a move like c5 or bishop e6 h4 he takes on g4 i think i have to castle first i castle queenside it is not so difficult as it looks. I think I have to develop first my bishop and then to ask his knight what he wants to do there and e5 all the time. To ask by my own knight, which should be able to retreat to d7. And then the decision for him will be not so easy. Okay, first the development. Bishop to e6. Well, he's probably going to play c5 if I don't do anything against it. c5. I would like to have my king on a1, but it takes time. I play king b1, and he plays knight e4 on knight d7. Knight d7 looks good. And then he has a threat with bishop f5. It's probably too slow. One has to be quick in these positions. I can play f4. Oh, he takes and plays knight h5. Cannot do that. Maybe my position is not as good as I thought. g4. What do I do? I get troubled on the f file. Or maybe not, maybe not. g4, knight d7, f4, takes knight g6. He can get two pawns for the exchange, but I think he loses one of them. Or he can... No, it begins to look rather nice. I think I have to play g4. It makes it impossible for him to get his bishop to f5. And now I'm ready to open files on the king's side. I have to play g4. Yes, this I have expected. This is a strong move because uh, for a while I'm not able to come with my bishop to this natural square f5. However, still I do have some pressure on the open f file. And uh, as I was prepared to do, I can now ask his knight, knight to d7. Well, I think I have to do what I planned. It's not nice to go away with that knight. I don't know, knight d3 is a move, but uh, I don't like it. He has very good play on the f-file. And I'm, I'm not ready to attack on the king's side then. I think I have to play f4, check once more, f4. He takes it, I play knight g6, he takes on e3, I take on f8, and afterwards I play queen e2, and I think, I think I win that pawn. f4 once more, take, knight g6, f3, that could be strong. I take the rook, he takes with the rook, and then I think I play queen h2, that looks very good. Yes, I must do that, f4. Yes, it's a typical combination again, which Bent likes to play. And perhaps it's the only move to have still a little play here for the Whites uh, yeah, game. Otherwise, uh, he should have gone back with his knight, but uh, this would have been no good, um, too passive. A uh, four is a very intelligent move. However, it should not be dangerous for me. I take it, of course g5 takes f4. Well, there's no choice. No, knight g6. Yeah. And now there are two possibilities. The first would be to sacrifice the exchange and to get a passed pawn on f3. This looks promising. If I should be able to come with my bishop from e6 to the long diagonal 
um, I mean uh, from H7 to B1, but how to arrange that? I should play F3, knight takes F8, rook takes, and then the next move perhaps king to H8 and bishop to G8 and H7 then, and to E4. If this would be possible, then the sacrifice should be correct, but he has a move in between. And I see one move which might be rather strong for white. Queen to h2. Yes. This forces either to exchange queens or to go back and then he would be able to attack this pass pawn on f3. Rook to f1 and queen to g3 it would win that pawn. Oh no. No, better not to sacrifice. I play the natural move, uh, rook to f6. Well, I cannot take on f4 with the pawn because he plays bishop takes g4. No tricks, no tricks. No, I have to take with the knight. Knight takes f4. Still, his knight is very active in strong plays, but not as strong as it was before in e5. And he has some weakness, in fact, uh, that's a pawn on e3. And uh, that's now easy to develop the last piece, the rook from a8 to e8, which will later attack that weak pawn. Oh, that is, that is annoying. He wins some kind of tempo, because when he plays bishop f7 later, He's attacking the pawn immediately. This is difficult. I don't like it too much. I can play rook g1. He plays bishop f7. And uh, in some cases, he plays g5 afterwards. I don't like it. I can protect e3, but still. Well, in some cases, I play rook g1 and g5, and my rook takes on g5, and then the other rook is on e1 and is unprotected. So he, he can take on f4 then. I don't like it. That was a strong move he made. Well, I think I have to protect e3 at once. Queen d2. I don't like to go away from that diagonal, but at least, well, okay, I p maybe it's good to get away from, from a white square where it can be attacked by the bishop. Knight b6. Okay, I play b3. Queen d2, not nice, but it protects e3, and behind it, it protects f4. Queen d2. Yes, it's a very clever move, but... Um um, it gives also some more counterplay at the queen swing. Now, it will be not so easy because he threatens now if I should do nothing to cover the pawn g4 and then to push these pawns against my king. But I shall have a lot of counterplay at the queen swing because just the queen is a little bit exposed on d2. I play knight to b6, where I shall have a threat uh, to go to c4. Well, I cannot allow knight c4, so I have no choice. After b3, his knight is a little misplaced, except for sacrifices. My king is a little open, but there's nothing else. b3. Bill Larson seemed to get away to a nice start, nice position in this game. Now he's all worried. What about? Yes, this, this pawn move that he's just had to make in front of his king. It's not nice moving the pawns in front of your king because they let the opponent attack. And what he's certainly worried about is this A pawn running up the board to weaken the king's defences. As I said earlier, this, this H6 pawn is an object for attack when white advances the G pawn. But this is a real weakness now. Well, let's go back to the game with uh, Schmidt Black to move to see how he can take advantage of this weakness he seems to have forced. This was probably the only move, and this weakens the, his king side as well, and I can now attack him. The question is who comes first? A5. 
That's the move, of course. I don't know why I thought he wouldn't do that. He's not such a player. I expected him to move his bishop away and have the threat on e3 again. Well, in such positions you have to be quick. King b2 is hardly a move. Maybe he plays queen b4. I think I have to start attacking. Rook g1, which rook? That's a problem because if I play rook d g1, then h3 is protected sometimes. That could be important. It's also a flight square for my king, but there's probably something wrong with it. I must make the natural move. Rook h g1. Yeah, now, of course, he wants to attack via g5 and so on. And, uh, however, my position still looks rather solid. All the pieces are well placed and uh, the, his attack might be dangerous, but uh, not so successful. Okay, to be consequent, a4. Yes. Normally one shouldn't take notice of such moves as long as they contain no direct threat. But maybe I can take it with the knight. Knight takes, knight takes, pawn takes. He probably plays rook a8. And even if nobody gets mated, I then get an end game with some weak pawns. Don't like that. I don't like that. I think I have to play g5. Yes. Nothing else. g5. So he is uh, attacking me as expected. Um, but now uh, the play will be more in the center. The question is, after having taken it off, where to go with my bishop? That's my main problem in this position. Well, pawn takes pawn first. Rook takes g5. And now, occasionally, I am threatening to check him at a3 and uh, to exchange queens and later to have some pressure against this uh, weak e pawn. Um, but this is a long way to go there. At first, I think I have to take on that pawn on b3, which will threaten to go to b2 then, or knight to c4, so he has to recapture. That's necessary. Well, pawn takes pawn, b3. He has too many threats now. Queen a3 check or knight c4. Or even b takes a2. I must recapture. a takes b3. And now, either a check on a3, or bishop to f5, or bishop to f7. All quite natural looking moves, um, which might be possible to play. Well, in my opinion, the bishop needs to go to f5, where he has some threats against the white king. It's a little bit exposed there, but I think it should be correct. Bishop to f5. Yes. Now he can force the exchange of queens any time, and then e3 falls. I have no time. I must be very quick here. I even think rook dg1 is not such a strong threat. It looks tempting to play knight h5, rook f7, rook g1 is no good, knight takes g7, I don't think that's good. Rook f1 is more interesting. But the main thing is I have no moves. I must play knight h5. It's the only way to create a threat quickly. I wonder if bishop f5 was his best move. I don't think I'm in trouble now. And I thought I was before. But it must be knight h5. Yes, knight h5. Uh, one minute Larson says he has no moves. The next minute he says he's not worried about his position. Uh, sounds like a muddle.
Yes, it is a bit. I think it's just one of those cases of, of seeing an attack coming in the distance, in this case the, the advance of the black pawn along this A-file, um, but that when it happens uh, he realises that it's, it's not so scary after all. His queen and knight are defending perfectly well and black's only attacking with a queen maybe to here. I think he's not, he's not as frightened now that it's happened as he was when he saw it. Right, well back to the game with Schmidt black to play in answer to Larson's last move which was knight to h5. There are not so many players who would have done this move. Um, Normally, they would have played rook from d1 to g1 and to attack my g-pawn by the two rooks. But now he is attacking everything on g7 and f6. And uh, there is only one move in the moment, rook to f7. And let's see what we'll, he will do then. Well... He didn't play queen a3 check. He could have forced the exchange of queens, but of course he, he likes to have that threat down there. Now, knight takes g7 is no good. He checks with the queen, exchanges queens. I take his bishop after he has taken my knight, and then he takes the pawn on e3, and I get a difficult ending. Three weak pawns, not nice, not nice. Rook g1, I don't think creates many threats. I think I must play rook f1. It's nice to attack that bishop. And indirectly you attack that rook which is defending everything. I must play rook f1. Wonder what he's going to do against it. I think I'm, I'm okay now. Rook f1. Sure. He's attacking me all the time. He did not uh, get into my trap uh, to take uh, the g-pawn by the knight. I should have checked him on e3, exchanged queens, and then after rook takes knight and rook takes bishop, I should have had uh, just a very promising ending after rook eight, e8 takes e3. But this now is dangerous. He threatens now to take my bishop off, and I should do something against, of course, but how? A solid way would have been now here, perhaps, uh, queen to a3 check. And this forces to exchange and then to cover my bishop or to retreat it. Or to retreat it immediately, bishop to g6. And if he takes my rook, king takes, mm, then his knight could get back to f4. And the whole position is the same. And about even, I think. No, why not to play g6? This should be possible. If he plays the knight to g3, then queen check on a3, queen goes in between, exchange queens, and then king takes and bishop f, no, d, d3. Oh, this would be very good for black, of course. Uh, this would be a nice line. Does he want to play so? <laughs> Uh, not sure. Well, let's try this G6. What's happening? What's happening? He should have checked me and exchanged queens. What's happening now? I, I take, and then that gives me the square C2 for the king. I don't see what he can do against that. Yes, yes, this is fantastic. Three moves ago I thought I was in trouble. Rook takes f5, he takes, I take, check with the queen. Wonderful. Rook one takes bishop. Oh my goodness, I made a blunder, I see it now. I, this move g6 was terribly bad. I should have checked him on a3, of course, and to play the natural line. Now suddenly I see it. Uh, he threatens to mate me or wins the queen after all. Oh, goodness, I could resign immediately after this. <laughs> oh, well, he did it very cleverly. Myself, I was a fool to play that way. Okay, what to do? I have to take and to play a few more moves only. Rook takes rook. Well, I take, of course. 
Rook takes. Yes, and now I see this trouble. If I should take it immediately, then queen check on g2, and then queen check to g7, king to e6, and knight to f4, and everything is over. Well, the only th possibility in the moment is to check him so that after this variation, knight f4 check, king could get away via d6. But he has another solution, as I see. However, I cannot help. Queen check, a3. Well, now if I interpose the queen, I get this very interesting knight ending. But why should I do that? King c2 is safe. It looks absolutely safe. He has no threats. He can be desperate and play knight c4. I take that. Yes, yes, it's amazing how well my king is protected now. King c2. Tja, and what can I do? Nothing. The only way is to take this rook off. I should have liked much more if he would have gone in between um, with his queen. But now I'm lost, I see it. However, the last two or three moves. Pawn takes rook. Well, queen check, of course, yes. Queen g2 check. Uh -huh. King has to move to f7, the only one. Well, and I have another check. Queen g7 check. King to e6 forced. Well, now I have two lines. It's tempting to take on b7, because then I threaten knight g7 check. But on the other hand, queen e5 check, he has no answer. What's wrong with me? Why do I want to take on b7? I must play queen e5 check. It's a beautiful move. Yes, queen e5 check. Yes, now the game is over. Either I have to go to d7, then knight checks and wins everything on e8, or king goes back to f7, then he mates me in two. Queen to f6 and uh, Queen g7. Well, in fact, it's now all over. I think I have to resign. Bill Lothar Schmidt explained uh, fairly clearly why he was going to lose. Just show us again exactly why he did resign. Yes, it's worth looking at. The, the black king's in check from the white queen, and it has only two squares to go to. If it goes backwards to d7, then the white knight comes into f6 with check, and the knight on f6 would also be attacking this rook, adding to the queen's attack on it, and black would just lose a whole rook. Mm -hmm. But if he goes the other way, let's see what happens. King to f7, and now the queen comes one square closer to f6 check. Only one move for black, back to g8, and the queen closes in for the kill. Queen g7 is mate, absolutely typical queen and knight mate, knight protecting the queen, queen mate on the edge of the board. Mm. It was an interesting game, that, because at one time, certainly, uh, Larson seemed, if not beaten, certainly to be not going to win. How did Schmidt lose what looked like quite a strong advantage? Yes, so many chess games are decided just by one bad move, and that, that g6 pawn move by Schmidt, just overlooking Larson's sacrifice and bringing the queen in, mm. that was just the end of the game. There's no reason he should, should have lost the game apart from that. He had a perfectly good position. Mm. Well, the result of Larson having won that game is that it opens that group completely wide. Anybody could now win Group B. Next week we're going to leave that there. We're going back to Group A, which, just to remind you, looks like this. And it just so happens that the person who's top in this group, Nigel Short, has to play the person who's bottom, Vlastimil Hort, and the two in the middle, Gligerick and Byrne, have to play against each other, which means we could have a four-way tie perish the thought. Next week we stay with that group. We shall in fact be seeing the game between Gligerick and Byrne. Until then, from all of us here in Bristol, good night. What sort of game do you expect it to be?